The title of the message this morning is Passover, Jesus, and Hearts on Fire. It's from Exodus chapter 12, focusing primarily on verses 21 through 28. One more time, Passover, Jesus, and Hearts on Fire from Exodus 12. So last time I preached, we finished the book of Jude together. Starting next week, Brian will be blessing us for much of the month of June by preaching and finishing up the book of Titus. Then after the 4th of July, Lord willing, Brian and I will be preaching through a series on manhood and womanhood starting somewhere around July 11th. So, With that as the schedule, instead of me starting something new between then and now, as we were going through Exodus on Wednesday, and we were in chapter 12, and we have been for two weeks now, it was impressed upon me, it seemed important to me that I would preach at least one sermon on the Passover. So this morning, my message is from those readings that we've been focusing on, and I think often as we think of the Old Testament, and I know this is true of my past experiences, myself included, I'm including myself in this, often we teach or read or talk about or preach the Old Testament as though it is just a story. Or maybe history, which it is. And often we look for ways to find moral applications only. We hear Old Testament stories and whether it's Noah and the ark or David and Goliath or Daniel and the lions. As we teach or read, we look and we see, oh, look at Noah. We should be more faithful and steadfast and work harder like Noah. Or we should be braver like young David or bolder, more bold like Daniel. And there's definitely awesome moral applications There are characteristics in all of those people we should desire. There's something to learn from Noah and Daniel and David about how we should and should not live. Surely that is there. But we cannot teach the Bible and only look for moral applications and stop there. As an aside, this is why I am so scrupulous about what we are teaching the children in our church. Because this way of looking at the Old Testament, or the whole Bible for that matter, becomes moralism. As though we could just, if we could just be more like these good characters, then we would be more Christian. If that's all the Old Testament or the Bible for that matter is, simply something to be taught in that way, then we are in great danger of missing the entire point. God. And our great, desperate need as sinners for a salvation, for a Lord and a Savior whom God has sent in His Son, Jesus, to save us from our sin. And yes, then, moral application as we follow Him and study His Word, and by His Spirit, He will make us more like Him. So this teaching or preaching of here's an Old Testament story, this person did this good thing, do that, this bad thing happened, don't do that. Try your hardest to be good. That's not at all the truth of what we are to see. The good news is not that we are good people trying to be better people. All of that is pointless without the cross. Impossible, for that matter, without the one that everything good in the whole Bible is pointing to, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Every word of the word is part of a bigger story, the best story, the good news, the gospel. We need to see that. We need to look for that. I hope we see that this morning, that we... We're created by a God who is perfect. A God who is holy. Everything he does is right and good. He is love. 
And that God, that creator God, created us to live in a way that would show his glory, to image his goodness to the world, that we would trust him in all that we do, in all that he says we would do and find good because we love him and trust him. And we know we have not. No one is righteous, not one. And so we need help. We need mercy. We need grace. We have sinned, each of us. We need a Savior. We need a Lord to follow. That, that God that created us is infinite. He is eternal. He is righteous. He is holy. And so any sin against Him deserves infinite, eternal punishment. That's what we all deserve. And there's only one way one way for us to not get that, and that is if God would save us. And we know the good news. We've heard it a few times already this morning. He sent His Son, His perfect Son, His eternal Son, His infinite, righteous, holy Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Son, came, lived a perfect life, died the death we all deserve, And he didn't stay dead. He rose again from the dead. And all who would believe upon him, who would trust in him, put their faith in him, repent of their sin, stop living for self, turn to Jesus, live for him, trust him, love him. All who would repent and believe will be saved, are saved. And then, yes, when we have been saved by the blood of Jesus, filled by the Spirit, and given a new heart and mind by God. What happens then is, yes, we will want to obey God. We will desire Him and His rules and His laws and His loving, righteous way to lead us to everlasting life. But only, only through Jesus can that happen. It's the only way. And there may be no better place to see the good news of the gospel in the Old Testament than in the Passover. The good news that salvation belongs to the Lord. Pointing us to Jesus Christ who came to die for sinners. Because we could never save ourselves. Without Jesus, we are like the Israelites in Egypt. Slaves. We're all slaves to sin unless God sets us free. We can't by our own power overcome sin. It will find us, it will keep us in chains unless we are set free by God. In the Passover, we're going to see, we're going to try to connect the dots. They're already there. So we should pray that that God would connect the dots, help us to see what is there for us. See Jesus the cross, the narrow path to salvation. See communion and see what it means to live our lives together as the church. This is how we should always read the Old Testament. It's how we should always read the Bible for that matter. We should open our Bibles. We should open them not to just look at words on a page, but to dig for treasure. To look to search for God, to search for His truth, not our truth. And then to see that Jesus is the treasure. And ask Him to help you see through His Word, to hear the Word when preached. And then ask Him to empower you to live your life exactly how He calls us to. Because He is so good and worthy. Matthew 6, 33 Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then all these things will be added to you. But we should ask a question. Is the Old Testament truth? Are the Old Testament promises really for us? For all of us who believe? Wouldn't it be awesome to read the Old Testament and instead of reading it like it's for someone else or for those people or for the Israelites or Jews, but to read it, all of it, as though it is all for us. 
in speaking of the gospel. In Romans 9, in speaking of how he was given the gospel for Gentiles, for the elect Gentiles, not only for Israel, Paul explains that all of the promises are indeed for us. That us who by faith in Christ have become the children of the promise. That those who are children of God, who are saved by faith, are spiritual Israel. And therefore the promises were always meant for those who God saves. For all time. Romans 9, verses 6 through 9. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not, hold on to this now when we get to the Exodus, for not all who descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are the ch- are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said about this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. So as we open our text today, we should see that not all who are Israel, Jewish by descent physically, not all who descended from Israel are truly Israel. Remember Jude 5. Jude 5 says, Now I want to remind you that although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Not all who are of Israel are truly of Israel. So then who is truly Israel? If not those who are Jews based on their DNA test, then who? Is it all, just all those who live in the land of Israel? Who is it? Who are the children of the promise? Galatians 3, chapter 7. Know then, that is, those of faith, those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, this is awesome, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. He goes on, chapter, verse 22. But the scripture imprisoned everything under, under sin, see why? So that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. There's a lot more that could be said, but here's the dots I want to connect with this truth before we look at Exodus. I want you to clearly see what we see in Exodus 12 is for us. Pointing them at the time and us to the only one who can save, Jesus. Jesus, who Jude says, saved a people out of Egypt. One more, 2 Corinthians 1.20. For all the promises of God find their yes in him, Jesus. That is why through him we utter amen to God for his glory. Because if all the promises are yes in him, then we by faith can look at all the promises and say they are for us. So what we see today, and we read in the Old Testament the promises, we say if our faith is in Jesus, then we read them and we say, Yes, amen. Glory to God. Thank you, God. This is for us. We whom God has chosen to save. We are children of Abraham, the true children of Abraham. Children of the promise. So we can say, thank you, Jesus, for saving us from Egypt from the Pharaoh. So yes, the promises are for us. And yes, they're all about Jesus, the only Savior and Lord. So what should that mean for us if that is true? 
I want to look at one more thing to help us see this. If the promises are for all those who believe in, by faith, We need to see something else. I want to look at one of my favorite New Testament accounts in the Bible, Luke 24, so we can see what's happening here. Let me set the scene. Jesus has resurrected from the dead. Jesus died in the tomb, alive, resurrected from the dead. So this Jesus we see in this text is the resurrected Lord Jesus. And we get these two dudes. They're walking along a road. They're sad. They're giving up. Luke 24, 13, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So they're, they're walking along this road. They're walking, notice, away from Jerusalem. Verse 15, while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus resurrected, Lord Jesus. Jesus drew himself near and went with them. So they're walking, they're talking, and now there's a third one there with them. Jesus is walking with them. I pray that you see the awesomeness of what I'm about to reveal here or what the Lord would reveal through his text. They don't know Jesus is the one walking with them. They just are like, okay, there's some third guy walking with us. They don't know the resurrected Lord in Jesus is walking with them because he doesn't allow them to know. He doesn't reveal himself to to them yet. And he, Jesus, said to them, as though he didn't know, he says, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor into Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and the rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us, They went to the tomb early that morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it as the woman had said, but him, but him, they did not see. Jesus listens, still hasn't revealed himself because There's something they need to see first. There's something that he needs to show them so that they can fully grasp and understand it rather than just revealing himself to them right away. Notice they pretty much tell the gospel to Jesus. Minus the resurrection of Jesus. It ends him, him they did not see. So they're sad. They know the gospel without the resurrection is pointless. So it seems like they're giving up. They say to Jesus, Are you the only one of the millions of people who did not who did not do not know what just happened? So think of what that tells us about what Jerusalem was like at that time. There's millions of people there. And they say to Jesus, not knowing it's Jesus, Are you the only one who doesn't know what just happened? Jesus could have said to them, actually, I am the only one who knows the fullness of what just happened. But he waits to reveal it to them because there's a better way to show them. Don't miss this, church. Let this truth motivate you to stay awake for the entire sermon this morning. Let this truth make you excited to show up eager to open the word together on Wednesdays and Sundays. Let this truth, remind yourself of this truth every single time you open your Bible. We as a church center our lives around Jesus. We desire to see him and know him and know him more through every single word of his word. Why do we do that? 
See what Jesus does to these men. And think of what we do as a church and what we're about to do with Exodus 12. Verse 25. He said to them, O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? They still don't know it's him. And he says to them, in their sadness, as they're walking away, like a couple of Eeyores, with their heads down, sad, just walking away, they've given up. And he says to them, you foolish ones. Can't you see what's truly in the scriptures? That's what he says to them. You foolish ones. Can't you see what's there? What's he referring to? We must die and go to glory. And then Jesus does to them what I hope, what I have been praying, what I will be praying. I hope Jesus does this to every single one of you this morning, what he does to them. Verse 27, beginning with Moses, and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. May Jesus reveal himself to us today in Exodus 12. May this happen every time we open the word together. Jesus shows himself to them in all of the scripture, which would include probably a sweet and awesome session on Exodus 12. And remember, they don't, still don't know it's him. They don't even know yet that it's him doing this, revealing himself in the scriptures. After he teaches them that awesomeness, I, want, I also want to see what happens. He sits down to eat with them. When do they finally recognize it's him? After they do what, do they finally see? It's Jesus. This, this, this man that has taught us in the word that everything was about Jesus. It's actually him that taught us that. How does that become known to them? Verse Verses 30 and 31. When he, Jesus, was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. In the taking and blessing and breaking of bread. How awesome is that? Pretty cool also that he vanished. I don't know exactly what that means. But how awesome is that? That after the revealing of himself, of Jesus through the word, through the scriptures, and the breaking of bread together, it is revealed to them, we'll see in their hearts, that it's all about Jesus. Verse 32. I want you to see what happens, what they realize and they go, notice, they go from sad and walking away to happy and excited and bold and running back. Why? What causes them to do that? Verse 32. They said to each other, now he's gone. Did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us on the road while he opened to us the scriptures? They look back and they realize what had been happening when he was teaching the scriptures to them. It's after they, they break bread with him and they realize it's him that they think back and they're like, wait a second. That's why our hearts were burning when he was opening the scriptures to us. Jesus taught them about Jesus in the Old Testament. Jesus exegeted the Old Testament for them and exposed to them how it was really about him through the scriptures. And I would say to us, if we look, if we are taught, if we see that he is there, our hearts should burn. 
They started off sad. They didn't know what to do next. Then an Old Testament teaching about Jesus turned their hearts on fire. And what do they do next? They rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those who were gathered with them together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed. He has appeared to Simon. They told what happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Church, there's a lot for us here to, the, to say in the book of Exodus. There's a lot for us to see. But we should ask a question right now. Does what is happening in our world or in your own life have you sad? downtrodden, bored, wondering what to do in this post-Christian, confused, and lost culture? Are you not fired up for the Word of God? Do you need a reminder about why we do what we do? Look what Jesus did to blow their minds and set their hearts on fire. He opened the Scriptures. He taught them about Himself in the Old Testament. He showed them that Jesus is the key that unlocks the whole Bible. That Jesus is the only way to salvation. And it was always that way. Jesus is the one whom if you know him and you see him and you see him in his word, you will happily tell everyone about him and obey everything he says. And notice the role of the breaking of the bread. And notice the first thing they do is they go encourage the church. Encourage one another. May God do all of that in our hearts and in our church today. Open Exodus 12, verse 21. I'm going to start with verses 21 through 23. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go, select lambs for yourselves according to your clans, and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of, the, of his house until it is morning, until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. God's word to us this morning. So this is the night that laid much of the foundation for what we, God's people, throughout all time would know about how God saves his people. This historical event and the continual remembrance of it leads to, points to, one of the traditions we are told to practice when we meet together. A practice, a tradition we're to hand down and continue to practice communion, the breaking of bread, and the taking of cup. So let's look. It's taken us two Wednesdays, and we're still not through, so obviously we won't be looking at everything we've looked at, but I want to look very closely at three things we can see about Jesus. His blood, our salvation, and our life together as the church. At this point, when Moses calls the elders to tell the people this message, we have to remember there have been nine plagues at this point. Moses had been sent to Pharaoh over and over. If you look closely, the nine plagues are seemingly grouped into three sets of plagues. So plagues one, two, and three, then four, five, and six, then seven, eight, and nine. Each of the three plagues, so one, four, and seven, start with them going before Pharaoh in the morning with a warning. On the third plague of each set, 
3, 6, and 9, there's no warning for the plague to come. God, in most of the plagues, either implicitly or explicitly, sets apart the Israelites in Goshen with protection. God protects them. And we are told of nothing that they do to earn it. Nothing. They're distinct. They're set apart, chosen by God to be the people through whom God will send a Savior, our Savior, His Son. So they're set apart and protected. Each of the plagues has a specific purpose. There's a reason for each of these. God is not doing this randomly. And each of them has a purpose for the Egyptians and for the Israelites. We won't go into it all, but the plagues are attacking the theology. So each of these plagues is attacking the theology and the worldview of Egypt. Showing a few things, that Pharaoh is no god at all. That none of their gods or idols are. Showing that there is one true God in control of all things. Weather, animals, sickness, death. Showing us to be powerless. And God to be sovereign and powerful. So God's showing something to the Egyptians. We're told in the word that it is so that they would know that he is God. But God is also teaching something to his people. And therefore us. What is that? What is he showing his people through these plagues? Through the attacking of the theology and the worldview and the idols of Egypt? Well, first... He's showing them and us that it is only by God that Israel could get out of Egypt. But he's also showing his power and his glory, attacking these idols to get Egypt out of the hearts of Israel. They'd been there about 400 years. In many ways, they had become like the world they lived in. They were influenced by the culture. They had a love-hate relationship with their slavery. As a time later, they actually wished they could go back. We know God could have just killed all of the Egyptians in an instant and freed his people and sent them to the promised land. But this was meant to show them and us something much greater. God sent the plagues and did so in a very specific and methodical way. It is to show that Egypt, to Egypt, that in fact he is God, but it is also grace. Grace to his people, then grace to us, that he would show us the truth of who he is and how he saves. Show us that Egypt, our culture, the world, and all of its idols and ideas are worthless, powerless. Nothing is more powerful than our God, the only God. The gods of this world and all the cultural temptations and all of its lies, powerless, false, evil, a trick to capture us in slavery. So we should flee from them. I'll come back to this. So yes, God was saving them, those people, physically from Egypt. But he's saving them and us, theologically, from Egypt and the lies of our culture. Saving us from foolishly following the ways of this world, not seeing the slavery that it is. Not seeing that slavery comes with death. They needed to see that the gods of Egypt were all idols. So God one by one, takes down the idols. And all of the false theology of Egypt, step by step. We need to see this, church. Both the idols in our world, all the false woke values that are being pushed in the world, the false theology that has entered the church needs to be taken down, one by one, by God and His Word. 
as, ex- as in Exodus, God does with the plagues. But then comes the tenth plague. The last one. The plague of plagues. For this one, now Israel is told they need to do something. They need to respond to what they've seen God do. They need to prove that all these false idols and false theologies that have been taken down, they don't love them, they don't want them, they trust God. We're told that they need to perform, to do an act of faith. We need to see that. That God here, through an intercessor, Moses, who then tells these elders to give God's people detailed instructions. And they are to obey. So God's people know exactly what to do. And if they do not fully understand why, they still are told to obey. We don't know how much it is that they fully understood with the lamb and the blood and the doorpost. But we are told God said it, they are to obey it as an act of faith. That they would by faith submit to God and be saved. By Jesus, remember Jude 5. Yes, these people are told to submit and obey. Because church, there's something we need to know about submission. True submission is when we obey, even if we do not fully understand or agree. Otherwise, it would not be submission. Let me say it again. True submission is when we obey, even if we do not fully understand or agree. Otherwise, it would not be submission at all. So they're told, kill the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost, close the door, stay inside. That's how you'll be saved. And they're to obey. Moses tells the elders to tell the people how to be saved from this tenth plague. That this plague will bring judgment by death. And there's only one way, one path to be saved from it. Let's see what they're told to do. Let's see how it points us to Jesus. Let's look and see why it should make our hearts burn. How is God telling the good news here in the Passover? There's many, 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 many ways the Passover points us to Jesus. But I want you to see the gospel in these three ways. The good news of salvation in the Passover the gospel through the Passover, how to be saved from eternal death, seen in these three things that they had to do. Number one, the Passover lamb must die. The Passover lamb must die. Exodus twelve twenty one. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go, select lambs for yourselves according to your clans, and kill the Passover lamb. First gospel truth. There is no passing over. There is no passing over of judgment and sin. There is no salvation from eternal death without a lamb being killed. God is saying a substitute must be offered. Someone must die for you to be set free. God did not tell them, go home and earn it yourselves. Go home and make sure you do these good things. Say these things. God didn't tell them to go make their goodness the pathway for their salvation. God mentions nothing about what these people have ever done in their lives. God never says even that they chose him in any way. He chose them, and he said, the only way for you to be passed over to not experience God's judgment and wrath is to have a lamb die in your place. We learned earlier in the text that the lamb must be without blemish, so a perfect lamb, that the lamb must be male, so a male perfect lamb must die for you to not experience 
eternal judgment. We know in this time in Exodus, there are over one million Israelites. So we're talking about a lot of perfect male lambs. How will each of them ever find a perfect male lamb to kill that their house might be saved? That's to show us something. That our only hope is if God would provide us with a perfect lamb. God must provide the lamb. We know from Exodus 12, 11, it says, it is the Lord's Passover. So this Passover is the Lord's. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So he chooses the Israelites based on nothing about themselves. He then says the lamb must be killed. He provides the lamb. Think back to Abraham and the ram provided. The Lord must provide each of them with a perfect male Passover lamb. And the lamb we see must die. The lamb must be put to death. So I'm sure you've done this already in your mind, but hit fast forward. Thousands of years later, a couple thousand years ago, Jesus. Jesus comes on the scene. John the Baptist John the Baptist sees him and immediately says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Every single one of those Passover lambs on that day was pointing to this one, to Jesus. Be sure to know John the Baptist was referencing the Passover. Paul says this to the church in Corinth to be sure that we know this. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump that you, as you are really unleavened. So get rid of the sin. Get rid of the sin to show you are a new person, a new creation. Get rid of the sin. And then he says why? For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. The lamb must die. In order for sin to be covered, for any to be saved, a perfect male lamb must be killed. Ultimately, the Exodus Passover is a foreshadowing of what Christ has done. For all who would trust in him by faith, in order that you would be saved, we would be saved from eternal death. At the first Passover, God's chosen ones, Israel, are saved from death by the death of a perfect lamb. We, church, God's chosen ones, by faith, are saved from eternal death by the death of a perfect lamb. His name is Jesus. Jesus died as a ransom for those whom he came to save. Jesus was killed, the lamb of God, put to death on a cross. Jesus, the ultimate Passover lamb that this Passover in Egypt was always pointing to. Jesus was killed. Jesus was without blemish. Jesus, the perfect lamb of God. If you have, by faith, trusted in Jesus to save you from eternal death, then Jesus, the lamb of God, was killed. Killed for your sin. Number two. The blood must be applied. Verse 22. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel with the blood and the two doorposts with the blood that's in the basin. So the lamb had to die But then for Israel to be passed over, the blood of the lamb had to be applied. They couldn't simply kill the lamb. There was a purpose beyond the killing of the lamb. They were to apply the blood to the frame of their doors. 
They were applied the blood to the vertical posts and the horizontal frame of their doors. So the lamb must die, but then it is the blood of the lamb that will keep the angel of death away. It's the blood of the lamb when seen by God and applied that is a covering for God's people. It's by the blood that our sins are passed over. Let me say that again. It is by the blood that our sins are passed over. Peter and 1 Peter. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you, just look at why, knowing that you were ransomed from your feudal ways, ransomed, somebody paid the price, from your feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. What was the price? What was paid? The precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot the Passover lamb of the Exodus was pointing us to the lamb of God the son of God our Passover lamb Jesus Christ and the blood had to be applied to the door frame and as we see that blood is pointing to his blood Jesus bled when he died on the cross We cannot just know in our minds that Jesus died and be saved. His blood must be applied to our lives. Which happens through repentance and faith. See what Peter is saying to us though. Peter is saying, we can know we've been redeemed. We can know for sure we've been redeemed by his blood, our sin-stayed lives has, have been cleansed. His blood was the payment for, the ransom for our sin. His blood, the new covenant for us means, Peter says it means, if you've been covered with that blood, if you're truly saved, if you've truly been covered your sins by the blood of Jesus, you should conduct yourself with fear of God. Live as holy. Live set apart from the ways of the world. New heart, new spirit, so that we would walk in new obedience. That's the new covenant. That we would not, that we would not live like the world lives. That we would be totally set apart from the ignorant ways of this world. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus. Because of his blood, we are sealed for salvation. So we are saved, justified, sanctified, kept for Jesus, set apart to live holy and obedient lives all by the blood of Jesus. 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. The perfect lamb of God died, so his blood must be applied to our lives. Number three, we must stay inside in Christ. Verses 22 and 23. Take the blood, dip the blood, that <clears throat> take the, a bunch of hyssop, dip the blood that is in the basin, touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin, and then listen. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. When he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. So the lamb must die, the blood must be applied, and we must stay inside. The lamb of God, Jesus Christ, died on the cross. His blood shed for the forgiveness of sin, but salvation comes only to those who are found in him. 
It's not enough, again, to simply know in your mind that Jesus Christ died. It's not enough to say that, oh yes, his blood must be applied to my life. Those who persist to the end will be saved. We must be found in Christ to be saved from eternal death. So I ask you, what do you think would have happened to anyone who would have killed a perfect male lamb, put the blood on the door perfectly, put the blood on the lintel, and then went back outside to Egypt to live like the Egyptians? Or even to look back once in a while to see what was happening in Egypt, to be entertained by what was happening in Egypt from afar. Remember Lot's wife who looked back on Sodom and Gomorrah as they were being destroyed for, by God for their wickedness. Don't go outside of God's protection and look for salvation. Don't go out of God's covering Be found inside. It is in Christ and in Christ alone that salvation is found. He is the narrow path. He tells us how to stay on the narrow path. And then he keeps us. There's no safety, there's no security in the ways of the world. There's no better knowledge or wisdom out there. We're not getting as a human race any smarter unless we're growing in faith and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and his ways. Everything else is futile. There's no hope to be found in this culture. Or on Netflix or Instagram or Twitter or politics or wokeism or anything else. Other than the way of God, the Son of God, and the word of God. Psalm 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Delight, joy. On his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither. All that he does, in all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so. They are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. There's something good about how the, the the way the world is headed. There's something good in it for us. There's something good in the fact that all the lies and deceptions of the world are being exposed, even on the news day by day. There's something good in the fact that the American culture is revealing itself for what it really is. And that is, it's becoming more clear for God's true people that there are only two ways to choose. The wide path that almost everyone is on that leads to destruction, or the narrow path. You cannot walk with one foot on the wide path and still be on the narrow path. Like at the Passover, there was no salvation for anyone who was found out there. There's also a sweet warning here. Don't wait. Don't mess around. Don't just kind of open the door and have one foot outside the door and one foot inside the door, waiting to see what will happen. Just as they could not be found be. Just as they had to be found behind the door and not in Egypt, there was an urgency to this decision for them. Exodus 12, 11. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, you shall eat in haste. They needed to be ready at any moment. So to us, there is no better time than right now to put 100% of your trust in Jesus to kill any love or trust you have in the ways of this world. Repent of your sin if you have not. Confess where you have fallen. Put your faith in Jesus. Enter in. 
to the most holy of places, fellowship with Jesus. We're called to do this together. We are told we can enter together into the most holy of places in Christ. Notice, by the blood of Christ, who died for us, his church. Hebrews 10, 19 through 27. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, notice how? By the blood of Jesus. By the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his, notice the lamb must die, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast, stay inside to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Why? For if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there, is no longer, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adver- adversaries. Do you see it? Two options. Two options. And we, the church, are to play a role in helping one another stay inside in Christ. Our great high priest, who allows us to enter in by his blood, who tore the curtain through the tearing of his flesh. Hold fast. Stay inside in Christ together. Because Jesus is in us. His death on the cross was sufficient for the forgiveness of sin. His blood is the covering we need to escape the shame and guilt and condemnation. The judgment for our sin. And Jesus is the only comfort. Jesus is the ultimate safety and the only way to be saved from eternal judgment and death. The Passover lamb was pointing to Jesus. The lamb of God. The blood on the doorpost was pointing to the blood shed for the, his blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. And not only is Jesus also the door, to be found in Jesus is the only way to be saved from sin. Cleansed of it. Turn from it. Enter in to a life. Live for him. And stay inside. In Christ. Together. There's one more thing for us to see here. Remember when the guys on the road to Emmaus had their eyes opened? It's when they broke bread with Jesus. Also remember, in the Exodus, they're told to celebrate the Passover year after year with a feast and with bread. And they're to hand down that tradition to future generations. And now we have seen that the Passover points to Jesus. It always was. His body, his blood, to be saved is to stay, to be in Christ, pointing us to the gospel, But there's also a reminder here, a tradition for us to be practiced, to be handed down. First, look at why Exodus tells us we have traditions. First, to remember, verse 14, this day shall be a memorial day for you. That's the first reason we have traditions. Second, to teach others who God is and what he has done. Verses 24 through 27. You shall observe this as a statute for you and your sons forever. Why? When they come to you, when you come to the land the Lord will give you as he has promised, keep this service. When your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? Why are you doing this tradition? What is the point of doing this? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel and Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. So we observe traditions to remember and to hand down. To remember and to hand down. To teach, to keep a truth present for generations to come. 
God sets things as traditions for a reason, things that we cannot afford to forget. God sets them as traditions, the things he knows we will have a tendency to forget or struggle with. So this Passover tradition was for them to remember what God had done through the lamb and the blood. Then on a Passover, a week of Passover about 2,000 years ago, during another Passover, Jesus, God the Son, Lord and Savior, rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. You know what happens. We went through it. We went through it in Mark. And you know that that Passover week ends with Jesus dying on a cross. But Jesus had a meal with his disciples first during this tradition. Mark 14, 22 through 24. As they were eating, he took bread. After blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body. And he took a cup. We had given thanks. He gave it to them. And they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. A new covenant. A promise. And a new tradition. In the describing of the tradition to be handed down to us, Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 says this. Verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. We had given thanks. He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant, my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Passover, the unleavened bread, blood on the doorpost, now communion. Bread, blood, communion instituted by Jesus during the celebration of a Passover. Don't miss that. We take the bread, his body broken, given for us, and we remember. We take the cup, new covenant in his blood, shed for us. We remember. We remember Jesus died. Jesus, the Passover lamb, was killed for us. Jesus' blood has been applied to our lives to cover our sin. We take his body, we gather together as his body, but there's also a call to stay inside. We're told to practice this often until he returns. And not only to just remember through it, but to proclaim something through it, to remind and tell Proclaim his death forever. Every time we take the bread and cup reminds us to proclaim the gospel because there's no longer a need for us to kill a lamb to make a sacrifice. Actually, there is no sacrifice we can make to earn our salvation, to be saved because the blood of Jesus has perfected forever those who by faith are being perfected in him. So we practice the tradition of communion. To remember, to remind us, to tell the truth that the body of Jesus was given for us and the precious blood of Jesus was shed once for all for those who are found in him. It is finished. Church, as we take communion today, which we're going to do right after the message, think back to the Passover. And think of how Jesus has fulfilled all that it was pointing to. And I hope it makes our hearts burn. I hope something is revealed to us in the taking of bread. I want you to see and listen to how the people responded at the Passover to all of this news. First, I want to tell you something that's not in my message. So as I was singing, I had this picture in my mind. It was, I don't know where it came from. I had never thought of this before. I hadn't thought of it in all the time uh, spent preparing this message. (coughs) I had a picture of the church 
as all of the houses in Goshen. All of the houses of Israel representing different churches. And the blood, and the bread, and the taking of communion. But then it dawned on me in that moment that later many of them were not saved. They were destroyed. I didn't know Christian was going to read Hebrews 10, but as I'm having this vision in my head, Hebrews 3, Christian reads Hebrews 3. Let me remind you what it says. <coughs> Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things God had that were spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house. God's house. So I'm picturing all these houses as churches. And it says, Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house if, if, indeed, we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and hope. He goes on to say, Was it not those who left Egypt led by Moses and with whom he he was provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable, they who were saved, they who disobeyed later, were unable to enter. Were unable to enter because of their disobedience. So there's a proper response to all of this news. And we see it in verses 27 and 28. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so. As the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. That's what it means to be the church. If we're saying we're the church, or any church is saying they're the church, and not doing these things, then like these who later were disobedient and destroyed, the same for us. We should bow our heads in worship at this news. Our hearts should be on fire that Jesus has accomplished all of this for us. And then we should obey. Remember what the men on the road to Emmaus did when Jesus showed them in the scriptures the things concerning himself? They ran to Jerusalem. They found the church, the eleven, and they encouraged him, saying, The Lord has risen. They told what happened on the road and how it had been made known to them in the breaking of bread. So my call to us, church, may we worship. May we worship. May we obey all that the Lord has commanded. May we encourage one another. May we continue to learn and teach and preach the scriptures as a church. May God, through his word, cause our hearts to continually be on fire. May we turn from sin in the ways of this world. May we tell everyone with ears what Jesus has done and that he is risen. This world needs us to tell them the good news. If you want to see a revival, it has to start in us. It must be through us. Our hearts must be on fire. Judgment is coming for all sinners. There is one way to be passed over. Jesus the Lamb was killed. Jesus' blood has been shed. And only those who are covered by the blood of Jesus are being kept for Jesus. And may Jesus make himself known to us as we together break bread. Amen. Let me pray. Lord God, we thank you for your wisdom, for the wise ways in which you plan and purpose to show us your glory and grace. You could have done the Exodus in many other ways, but your ways are perfect. And so we thank you. We thank you for showing us that sin deserves death, that blood needs to be shed. And we thank you 
through your son Jesus who has died on the cross whose blood was and is the covering, the only covering for sin. May you start our hearts in our hearts a fire for you, Lord. May you cause us to be obedient to all that you have commanded. May you give us boldness, boldness to tell anyone who would hear that you have sent your Son and you, Jesus, are risen. May we enter to the holy place with boldness. Reveal yourself to us now, Lord, through the breaking of bread. Amen. So we're going to go straight into communion before we sing.